Is this it? No. So, um, my name is Mark Harbeck, and my job is to read nuclear medicine images at UCLA and also participate in treatment of patients using radionuclides. Um, and as um, Larry pointed out, I'll talk to you about how do we image prostate cancer. Um, I'll explain to you what type of scans are out there. I'll talk a little bit about the risks of radiation since that has gotten a bad uh, reputation. Um, and then I'll focus on why, how imaging helps in patients with prostate cancer, that is in staging, um, selecting patients for radio ligand therapy, and then also checking effectiveness of treatment. So how do we image prostate cancer? Um, when it comes to imaging, there are different types of scanning. Uh, there is anatomical imaging. Atomical imaging shows us structure. Uh, some of the uh, modalities or uh, technologies that are available to do that are CT, CAT scanning, MRI, which works with magnetic fields, CTs work with X-rays, ultrasound works with sound waves. And then we have molecular imaging that gives us molecular information about how the cancer cells are processing different uh, metabolites, um, how avid they are for sugar, and other things. And examples of that are SPECT imaging, which stands for Single Photon Emission Computed Tomography, and um, the more popular uh, PET imaging, which stands for Positron Emission Tomography. And over the last decade or so, um, these two imaging modalities have evolved to become what we call fused imaging. So this is SPECT-CT, where you combine SPECT with a CAT scan, and more importantly, PET-CT, which combines positron emission tomography with computed tomography. So these scans, these fused images, can show us structure from the anatomical imaging information, fused with molecular information from the, from the molecular imaging modality. To illustrate that, um, anatomic imaging, again, using x-rays, magnetic fields, or ultrasound image structure. So you have an x-ray producing machine, for example, a CAT scanner. It sends x-rays through the body, and then depending on how these x-rays get changed while they move through the body, it creates an image, and then the job of the radiologist um, who looks at the images is to identify what is wrong. And if you're a trained radiologist, um, you can see that there is a lesion here in, in one of the spinal vertebrae that is abnormal and that likely represents cancer. In molecular imaging, we use radioactive tracers. Um, and these tracers allow us to see what is happening inside the body at the molecular or cellular level. And these different tracers that are available, there are some that are specific for prostate cancer. So they target a structure that's present on the prostate cancer cells. The tracer binds to that structure and the tracer has a radioactive isotope attached to it that emits photons. These photons can be detected by special cameras such as PET cameras. And then the software creates an image. And then my job as a nuclear medicine physician is to, oops, sorry is to interpret those images. So an example that, um, of these tracers, and that's probably the most important tracer for prostate cancer imaging at this point, um, targets a structure that's present on prostate cancer cells called prostate-specific membranous antigen. And if you're knowledgeable in reading a scan, then you will see that there is a hotspot here, an area of tense tracer uptake that is not normal, 
probably reflect um, metastasis from prostate cancer. Now I should add that this PSMA tracer is currently not FDA approved. It's only available in a research setting in the United States. It is the standard of care for prostate cancer imaging in Europe and Australia and other parts of the world. There are other tracers that can be used for prostate cancer imaging. And some of you might have heard of Axumin. This is actually an FDA approved tracer for prostate cancer imaging. Its target on the prostate cancer cells are amino acid transporters. And then there are other tracers that have been around for a long time, C11 acetate and F18 choline. These are tracers that target uh, fatty acid metabolism cell membrane synthesis. Um, when you compare the effectiveness or the sensitivity of all these traces to pick up prostate cancer, so the sensitivity is the ability of a tracer or a scan to, to find the disease. And when these traces have been compared, um, then this tracer um, is the best one, uh, especially at lower PSA levels. So now when we go to, to fused imaging, as I pointed out earlier, we combine the structural information and the functional information, and then we get a PET-CT scan. And now you get kind of the best of both worlds. You get the structural information, and on top of the structural information, you get the molecular information. So when you see a lesion on CT, you can say, okay, this might be a metastasis, this might be something else, I'm not sure. If you have the molecular information, in addition to the structural information, you see intense tracer uptake here in this lesion that, you, that, is looks, some, that looks abnormal on the CT scan. <coughs> this is a tracer that is specific for prostate cancer, so now I, with a high certainty I can say this is um, in all likelihood metastatic prostate cancer. So since all these procedures involve radiation, frequent questions that we get from patients are how dangerous is that? Although the most common question that we get is, will I glow in the dark? <laughs> I've yet to see that happen, but I hope one day. So are you radioactive? Uh, no, the doses that we use for imaging are very low. Um, the, the isotopes have a very short half-life, um, and they're also excreted from the body via the urine. So um, by the time patients leave from our, from our clinic, um, regardless of what tracer they get for imaging, they're not dangerous, they're safe to be around in the public, and it's not a problem. Can you be around pregnant, uh, pregnant women and children? Absolutely uh, not a problem. Can you eat anything you want? Yes, you can eat anything you want, and we do encourage patients to drink a little bit more than usual when they leave from our clinic, beverage of their choice, um, including alcoholic beverages. And the purpose of that is just to flush out the kidneys from the IV contrast to make sure that there's no damage to the kidneys. So what is the dose that you get from, from a PET-CT scan? Um, so the approximate dose from a, from a PET-CT scan is 2.5 gram. This is just a unit that we use for, for, radi for uh, radiation exposure. And then if you look at the um, cancer risk uh, per dose, so a dose of 10 rem um, increases the risk of developing a lifetime cancer by 0.4%. One rem is 0.04% and so on. So the, these numbers are very abstract, they don't really tell you anything, so to put that into perspective, um, by living on this planet, the annual background radiation that you receive is 0.72 rem. And since we live on this planet, our bodies have evolved uh, by evolution to be able to deal with low-level radiation. Our cells have repair mechanisms that can repair damage from low-level radiation. Um, another uh, parameter that might help you put, this, put the, the dose of the PET scan into perspective, Pati uh, physicians and, and uh, nuclear medicine technologists that work with radioactivity are allowed to receive a dose of 5 rem during, their, during a year of working in, in, in the department. So twice the dose that you, can, that you would get from a, from a density scan. 
And then, um, in addition, if you look at the lifetime risk of developing a fatal cancer, it's already 20%. So by adding 0.4 or 0.04%, you don't really add very much. And then, of course, you're not doing the scan lightly. You're doing the scan because you want to get information from that scan because you already have cancer and you want to get the best possible treatment. So the overall risk that you get from a scan is negligible if you put it into perspective um, of how, it, how low it is and of how important the information is that you get from the scan to be able to give you the best possible treatment. Okay, so how does imaging help? Well, the most important job of imaging is staging and restaging. So staging tells us what the extent of the disease is, how, much, how far is it, it has spread, whether it's just local, whether there are a few metastases, or whether there are multiple metastases. So here's an example of a patient that um, has, was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Uh, a lot of what you see here is what we call physiologic uptake. These are normal tissues that express the PSMA target. The prostate cancer that you, see, you can see down here, and this is the only area of abnormal uptake. So this patient has localized disease, no metastasis, so the, the uh, disease can be attacked at this local level, whether it's with surgery or radiation, um, but uh, um, to hopefully the, the, <coughs> whatever treatment is chosen will cure this patient. And then there's something, and probably most of you are familiar with this term, oligometastatic disease, either at the time of diagnosis or by the time the cancer comes back. Oligometastatic disease is usually defined as uh, somewhere around five or less uh, lesions. And um, the current trend is to treat these lesions locally, usually with radiation, sometimes even surgery, and th thereby eradicate the disease or at least postpone the time until the disease progresses and requires a different type of therapy. And then, unfortunately, we also encounter patients that have white hemostatic disease. So in these patients, a localized treatment is no longer, doesn't make sense, no longer makes sense. sense. Uh, these patients have, go, have to go to systemic therapy, and the first line is usually androgen deprivation therapy. So the staging um, by imaging really dictates what the best treatment options for the patients are. So that's the importance of staging it, and then restaging for recurrent, recurrent disease. This is just <clears throat> one of our uh, earlier research studies where we looked at the impact of patients receiving this PSMA scan and how that changed the management of their prostate cancer. And we enrolled 161 patients in this study. All of these patients um, received the PSMA PET-CT scan and then we had um, pre- and post-scan questionnaires that were sent out to their urologists, asking them before the scan information was available how they would manage their patients. And then after the scan information was available, asking them again, same question, how would they manage their patients? And you can see that, um, that more, than half, more than half of the patients' management changes occurred based on the information that was gleaned from the scans that these patients had. Now, um, RLT stands for Radio Ligand Therapy, and uh, Dr. Kalei Jeremy is going to talk about that at, at great length after my presentation, um, is a therapy that, that uses radioactive isotopes to treat the cancer. So, as you recall, when we do imaging, we target a structure that's present on the prostate cancer cells, and our tracer has a radioactive isotope that emits photons that we use to make a picture. Now, when we do radio ligand therapy, we target the same structure on the, on the cancer cells, but we label the tracer with a different isotope. Whereas this isotope decays by emitting photons that we use for taking a picture, this isotope decays by emitting an electron. An electron travels, doesn't travel very far, but it locally bombards the tumor cells and destroys them. That is the principle of radio ligand therapy. Um, I should add that at this point, it's not FDA approved. Um, hopefully in the near future, there will be something that's available. <clears throat> so, 
when we do when we do a scan of a patient, or we want to see if somebody has extensive disease, we want to see a lot of uptake of the tracer that we use for imaging. If we see a lot of uptake, we know that the cancer cells express a lot of the target. If we don't see a lot of uptake, such as in this patient, we know there's not that much of a density of the, of the target on the cancer cells. So whereas this would be an ideal patient for radioligand therapy, this patient, you have to weigh the, the, the pros and cons before you decide to do it. And then, <clears throat> unfortunately, there are cancers that just don't express the target. So we do a scan. We see that the patient has disease based on the structural information that we get. Um, but if they don't express the target, then radioligand therapy is not an option because there's just, just enough, not enough um, of the PSMA target expressed for the treatment to go to the cells to destroy them. Once we treat patients, we want to check how effective the treatment is. In prostate cancer, it's a little bit different because here we have a unique tumor marker uh, that is very specific, that is only expressed by prostate cancer cells. So we can monitor the PSA, and if it's going up, we know that something's going on. But we do need to know how extensive the recurrence is, um, and that's where imaging comes in. So when we, when we have cancer and we, we treat the cancer, several things can happen. Ideally, what happens is that the cancer disappears. Um, the cancer can get smaller, which we call a partial response, as opposed to a complete response. And then we can have what we call stable disease. The cancer stays the same, it doesn't get worse. We keep it in check. And then unfortunately, we can also have progression of disease. The cancer gets bigger, new lesions occur throughout the body. Treatment is not working. And when we look at the molecular information, then what can happen, what usually happens is if the disease gets smaller, it also has less tracer uptake. Sometimes it gets smaller, but it retains the tracer uptake. It would still be a response to the treatment because it is getting smaller. Sometimes what we achieve with our treatment is stabilization of the disease, meaning, meaning the, the arrest the disease, it doesn't get worse, we can keep it in check for a long time and treat it like a chronic disease. Um, unfortunately, sometimes the disease gets bigger. In this case, it retains the, uh, the expression of the, um, of the PSMA target, um, meaning that, you know, theoretically radioligand therapy is an option. And then, in rare cases, unfortunately, what can happen is that the disease gets bigger and it has less tracer <coughs> uptake. This means the character of the cancer, the molecular makeup, has changed. It no longer expresses the PSMA target. Um, it has become a more aggressive tumor, and a different treatment modality has to be has to be a, a found for the patient to help them. So here's an example of a patient that had extensive disease um, and then was treated with radioligand therapy. And you can see then on the follow-up scan, um, all the diseases disappeared. <coughs> so this is the ideal case, of course, that we don't see very often. Okay, so what is imaging? So the Gallium 68 PSMA binds to the PSMA target that's present on prostate cancer cells. So why do we do imaging? We want to stage and restage the disease depending on what and on where you are in the treatment trajectory. And then, um, although this is currently only available as research, at least in the United States, um, once this becomes FDA approved, hopefully in the in the future, it will the imaging helps us identify candidates that. Are that should be that should that would be able to receive a radioligand therapy. When do you do imaging? Well, you do it usually at diagnosis for initial staging, and then uh, you want to restage after treatment, especially if the PSA disappeared after initial treatment and now the PSA is coming back. You want to know how extensive the recurrence is to decide on the best course of action. Okay, that ends my part. And I'll hand over to Jeremy, who will talk to you more about treatment. Thanks very much.
Yes, I have a strong French accent, so I will try to speak as slow as I can to make myself uh, the most understandable. Um, my slides are not as nice as Dr. Auerbach. I have to uh, specify that all the drawings that you saw, he does it handmade himself. Uh, mine are more detailed, so maybe you can have a little bit uh, come closer to the to the screen because uh, I fear that it's a bit too small otherwise. So that's my background. I was trained in Paris. Uh, like I said, please don't hesitate to come closer, to have a closer look on the screen. I was trained in Paris. My specialty is nuclear medicine and cancer imaging. And now I work at uh, UCLA as an assistant professor in Theranostic. What is Theranostic? Theranostic is the mix of the therapeutic and the diagnostic agent as the same, as a single one. That's how you create this new world, this new agent combining the same molecule with two different purposes, therapeutic and diagnostic. So the aim of this is to have individualized medicine. You see the target with the diagnostic and you treat the target with the therapeutic and then you have Patients that are negative for a specific target, patients that are positive for a specific target. Of course, the aim to have this diagnostic approach is to better select a patient before the treatment to know, or at least to try to predict who will respond or not. What is nuclear medicine? Nuclear medicine is the fact to inject a radioactive drug into a patient. This radioactive drug will go on a target many different targets. Here we talk about prostate cancer. And on this target, the radiation, the photons that are emitted by the radioactive drug will be used either for imaging, PET-CT, or either for molecular radiotherapy. Molecular radiotherapy means the same than radio ligand therapy, radio nuclear therapy, peptide, uh, radio nuclear therapy. All this means the same. It means a radioactive drug that goes on a target and that will treat locally the cells that are around. <coughs> Here we talk about a prostate cancer, the PSMA, prostate specific membrane antigen. So this is a good nuclear diagnostic target because it is highly overexpressed by the prostate cancer cells. It means the prostate cancer cells are different than others because they have a lot of this target, this PSMA target. Then I repeat, you can uh, inject a radioactive drug and it can be one that is called PSMA-11 for PET-CT or PSMA-617 for molecular radiotherapy. They both go on the same target, just the physical radionuclear that is attached is different. One is for imaging, one is for treatment. So that's the, terra the Terranostic approach. I'll give you just a quick uh, look on how it looks like. It looks like that. It comes in shielded in shield uh, vials for the treatment ones. Here are the precursor. It is kind of mixed or cooked together and you do the labeling. And then you have those ready to use uh, radioactive drug, single use for each patient. Then you inject it. There is a video, maybe you can click on the video, on the, on the image. Oh, Oop. It's gone back. I don't see on my screen. You have to click on the, on the image. I... Let's try. Okay. Number that was? Mm. Well, I can read you. Let me try. Oh, yes. All right. So here's a video just to show you nicely again what Dr. Auerbach and myself just explained. You have this radioactive drug that goes in the blood, that we go 
on the prostate cancer cells because they have this target, this PSMA target. And then once the PSMA pet agents bind to the target, it will emit the positrons, the photon or the radiations that will be detected by the PET CT device to create images and see where are those prostate cancer cells that express this PSMA target. In that case, you would see, for example, uh, bone metastasis in the body of the patients. Then you do the CT, right? And then you create images like that. All right, once you know that you have the target expression, you can change what you inject. This time you don't inject a PET imaging agent, you inject a treatment, a therapy agent. That time it will bind to the same target, but the radiations are this time different and they will kill locally the cells that have expressed the PSMA. And the aim is to destroy locally each of these cells selectively in comparison to the other tissues, the other cells that don't have this PSMA. Okay, that's the theory. Now let's look a little bit on the practical side. The practical side. First, where can we do it in the US? Like Dr. Auerbach said, unfortunately it is not FDA approved. Both the imaging and the therapy are not FDA approved. It is still research only. So when you go, I'm sure you know uh, the sites of clinicaltrial.gov that, uh, that list all the ongoing prospective clinical study, for example, in the US. So if you look at the uh, gallium PSMA PET imaging, where it is done, from the site I was able to pull out those locations. So you can see that UCLA is the only site in the Southern California region. I have to say that uh, PSMA PET is made on site with a radiochemist and so it's single site studies. It, all these sites has to fight to the FDA a clinical research protocol on their own. So it's academic single sites. Then you have big, uh, big trials that are conducted by industry, by the big companies such as Progenis. Here is the PYL, it is called, it's the same target, it's PSMA, it's just a different compound. And here they are doing a multi-center big study across the US. Um, I think the VA in LA is part of it, and there may be, I'm not sure, but maybe City of Hope in LA. At UCLA, like I said, PSMA is only research. So at UCLA we have developed a whole uh, Theranostic PSMA clinical research program. So we obtain IMD, this is the authorization to use a non-approved drug <coughs> on the US ground, both for the imaging agent and for the treatment agent. And then we have all these ongoing uh, clinical protocols that we are conducting uh, that cover basically all indications for prostate cancer patients. How do we do that? Uh, it is mostly funded by the patient themselves. Because we had sufficient proof from Europe and Australia that uh, the PET CT imaging was efficient, we were granted by the FDA to do a cost recovery mechanism. It was ethically acceptable that patients would pay for research non-approved drug because outside of the US it has been uh, shown to be effective. So patient pay for the scan at cost. There is no professional fee. It's more or less 2,007, 2,800 per scan. You can see we have several protocols that cover those indications. Here are the, uh, the contact of the study coordinators. I want to put the emphasis on one for the imaging part. That is a randomized trial in which we offer the scan for free, of course, because it's a randomized trial. Randomized means we randomly assign patients to one of the two groups. The first group is the control arm in which patients would receive standard radiation therapy for post-prostatectomy recurrence after surgery of their prostate cancer. 
and the second group, they would get the same treatment. The difference is we would offer them a PSMA scan for free before the treatment. Then we will follow those patients for five years, mainly based on the PSA, and see if the salvage radiation therapy after prostatectomy was more efficient with or without the PSMA scan. Because even if it's a good tool, that's true, we can see more disease, we still don't know if it really makes a difference on the outcome at the end. We still don't know if integrating this scan will really make a difference on the treatment outcome. So that's why we also have to conduct those studies. So just that you know, that's a way to have a 50-50 chance to get a, a free PSMS scan at UCLA. Uh, just that you know, the patients who are candidate for the study are patients with biochemical recurrence after surgery and candidate for salvage radiation therapy. So still a pretty early stage of the disease. I will uh, pass these details of the enrollment and the key points. Um, here are the contacts, we will share that again, so you are more than welcome to contact us if you have any questions about that. Let's talk now about treatments, molecular radiotherapy, radionuclear therapy, radioligand therapy. This drug that targets PSMA with molecular uh, radionuclear agents has been used so far mainly in Germany and in Australia. From this data, there is kind of a lot of hype around it, a lot of hope, because it has shown very promising results. Here is an example of a 71-year-old patient who has metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer, failed after chemotherapy, after Zytiga, after Xtendi, and after Xofigo. So he has not a lot of option anymore. You can see the disease a little bit of everywhere in the bones. And after one cycle, two cycle, three cycle, four cycle, you see the disease burden decreasing to almost nothing. The PSA also goes almost to zero, from 755 to undetectable. So that's a nice story. That's a nice case. That's what doctors and patients both want to see. It happens. It's true. It's not fake. But it doesn't happen all the time, I have to stress that. But it's still very promising. <coughs> very promising, so there is currently a lot of, uh, I call it hype around it. There are cover page in uh, medical journals, Lancet Oncology, big journals that publish those studies, image of the year, meetings, a lot of hype around it. People are even traveling to get these treatments. Uh, Outside of the US, uh, for example, this website, Booking Health, you put your disease, you put your destination, your age, and you have some centers, I was surprised to see that, that's from Germany, that provide for rates directly like medical tourism. So there is a lot of ongoing excitement around this uh, lutetium PSMA. Of course, industry is in this, uh, interested with that. So there is a company that is called Endocyte that started a big phase three randomized trial in which they randomized patients to either get uh, lutetium PSMA versus uh, standard of care treatment. This company has been bought by Novartis because Novartis truly believed that it would be successful and they invested uh, two billions of them. So there is a lot of hope, hype, noise around that. This study now is a big multi-center randomized phase three trial. There are like 60 sites worldwide. UCLA was part of, of this study. I will go a little bit into detail later on. Now I'm going to share our prior experience before this uh, big industry sponsored phase three trial. We have initiated on our own a phase two trial before the industry was coming in. This was a bicentric study. We did it uh, in collaboration with Houston. This is how we treated patients initially. So we were the first UCLA, thanks to our German colleagues who kind of helped us to set up everything at UCLA. We were the first to 
obtained by MD from the FDA to be able to do lutetium GSMA in the US and the first to treat patients with lutetium GSMA in the US. So let's say it's still minimalistic and we can progress about that, but that's the current setup. Patients would sit here, so it looks like a little bit, I would say, an oncology chemotherapy center. Uh, patients sit in a chair, they get some premedication before with anti uh, emetic treatments, they get some saline. We can cool the salivary gland because you have seen on the image there is some uptake. So when we started, there was a doubt on uh, some side effects of the salivary gland. Finally, after our experience, there is no strong side effect in the salivary gland with lutetium PSMA. So now we're not doing it anymore. Then the patient receives the injection over 30 minutes. There is no renal protection needed. And post-infusion, we re-inject a little bit of saline to flush a little bit the kidney, just per principle. And then patient gets discharged and they can go home without real special radiation protection. <coughs> Mm. Of course, the, the, the radiation that goes out of the body uh, is existing, but is very minimalistic. As you may have seen in the video, the radiation are emitted and stay in a very short range where it has been emitted to kill locally the cells. So only very few go out of the body. So you don't are, you are not, after receiving this treatment, really radioactive for your, uh, the people around you. I give you some numbers, just you don't have to take it religiously, but it's just to share our experience. When we put the data with Houston, we have 64 patients who received the treatment in our study. Here are the column with PSA decline to baseline. Meaning here that's the patient who did not respond based on the PSA. Here is the patient who had more than 50% of decline. And here are the patients who had more than 90% of decline, it means almost undetectable. And you can see at 12 weeks, and then the best overall response, and then the most recent one, remains pretty stable. You have the half of the patients who finally are not responding well, for who it doesn't work. You have one third of the patients who has a good response with a PSA of more than 50%. At this stage, it's pretty good. And you have this 10% of patients, 10 to 15 in fact, that have extremely deep and profound and durable response. And these patients, we're still following them and they're doing very well. It's only 10 to 15, unfortunately. Side effects, so you have seen, yeah, the salivary gland uptake on the images Dr. Auerbach showed you. So there is a little bit of toxicity on the salivary gland because the treatment goes there as well. But the side effects is pretty mild, well tolerated and reversible within a week on the salivary gland. So xerostomia means dry mouth. Uh, this is the grade. So grade four is very, uh, it's, it's uh, very severe, whereas grade one or two is very mild. So all those side effects are pretty mild and reversible, temporary, and well tolerated. Let's say the bad side effects, the ones that are considered uh, severe for the patients, as, as you can see here, are pretty rare, less than 5% of the case for nausea, vomiting, the uh, blood cell counts decrease. We do observe it, but it's still pretty rare. So compared to chemotherapy, it's very, very well tolerated. I just showed some articles that compare the, what we found at UCLA, is it what has been found to, into the other centers. That's the Australian study published in Lancet, so a very big journal. Here they selected more the patients doing another imaging scan to better select the patients, and they had a higher success rate, but they enrolled less patients. They selected more. That's a meta-analysis, so that's analysis that pool the data from different studies and they found more or less what we found. One third of the patients have more than 50% of decline. Same for a very recent uh, study from our colleague in Germany, uh, in Munich. So it works. It works in one third of the case you will have a good response. In 10 to 
50% of the case, you will have an incredibly good response. But in half of the case, it doesn't work. So we can still improve. Here I'll show you some examples. This is the case you want to see. You see some disease here, here. All these is lymph nodes you can see there, there. All gone. That's good. You see the PSA went from 36 to 8 after 3 cycles. That's the case you want to see. That is the case you don't want to see. PSA is 20, it goes to 100. Some diseases are in the bone, already a significant amount, and now it's progressing, exploding. So we are not there yet to say that it works for all patients, unfortunately. This is other example. I will skip that. This is um, a summary of the different pattern of response we can see based on the PSA curves. So you have uh, patients who are not responding, you can see the increase of the PSA, even if we inject the treatment, the small arrows here. You can see patient that has an effect, but not a true response. You can see patients that have a, initially a response and then they progress later on. And you can see patients that finally responded very well. So we have all these broad kind of different pattern of response. Let me talk now about the big, big trial that is ongoing, the endocyte uh, Novartis trial. Um, now we cannot do it at uh, UCLA, so uh, if for, by, by any chance you would be interested to be enrolled in that trial, it is not possible anymore at UCLA because uh, UCLA, such as other sites, has been suspended because they are fixing some issues. Here is the map that I kind of pull. I know that in Las Vegas or uh, in Arizona, Scott Dale or Phoenix or Portland, they are doing it now. So that would be uh, other options to be enrolled in that trial. As a reminder, this trial is for metastatic, castrate resistant prostate cancer patients that are progressing after one or two cycles of <coughs> chemotherapy. There is another. Uh, trial that is uh, conducted by another company that is called Advanced Accelerator Applications, AAA, that also has been bought by Novartis, by the way. And in this one, they do the same target, PSMA, they do uh, the same molecule mutation, just a little bit different uh, molecule, so um, it's not the same company. Here it's doable in Phoenix again, and in San Francisco. So that may be something uh, that can be interesting for patients that don't qualify for uh, this one. What is the future of this uh, molecular radiotherapy targeting PSMA? There is, you can change the radionuclear element. Instead of putting mutation, you can put actinium. Actinium is just has just different physical properties and the radiation that comes from alpha is much higher that comes from beta. So it will kill, it would kill in theory more cells. The problem here is it's that patients get more toxicity in the cellular gland because the radiation is too high. So it is unfortunately not ready for use yet, even if you see those impressive dramatical response here. Some patients were doing so bad with a salivary gland that it's still a problem. What is the future at UCLA? We are trying to go from that to that. It means to create true diagnostic centers combining uh, on an outpatient basis different specialties from nuclear medicine to oncology, urology, radiation oncology to provide this PET-CT imaging molecular radiotherapy, the diagnostic concept uh, on an outpatient basis. And with this, I thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to answer to the question you may have. Okay, raise your hand if you have questions. Let's see if uh, there's supposed to be a sound guy up there that activates that. Okay, is this working? Yes. 
Yeah, and I was just wondering, if the patients that did, were not successful in the, if, uh, with the trials, were there any common characteristics of those patients? So we are, of course, interested to look at that. Of course, we want to know who will respond or not respond. It's still too early to really uh, have definitive answers about that. For example, in Germany, they were doing, uh, in Australia, in the study, they were doing FDG PET CT. FDG show the glucose metabolism of the tumor. When the patient has too high glucose metabolism with a faint or low PSM expression, they excluded the patient. That explained why they have a higher success rate. So that was one way to stratify the patient. But no, unfortunately, it's still too early to have true category to tell which patient will truly respond or not. Currently, we're doing the scan. We assess the burden of the disease, the target expression. When it's obvious that the target expression is too low, we don't include the patient. But in many cases, we're still kind of trying because the patient did not have a lot of other options. And so we still involve many patients. And we don't have a true trend so far because the sample is too small. We, we are, it's too, still too early, in fact, to really tell who are the 10% that will respond forever and the 50% that will never respond. And we don't have the tool yet to really make a difference, unfortunately. How many? <coughs> REMS are in a CT. How many REMS? Yeah, I'm used to, he was talking, he was talking about REMS, various tests and stuff. How about for a CT? How many do you get CT. on a CT? It, de yeah. it depends, if it's just a CT of the abdomen pelvis. Right. It would be for, it would be about 10 millirems. That's all? Yeah. Okay. 10, what about 10, if you did 10 a, to 15, it depends on what type of scanner is used. Or what if you did a chest? So the, the whole body CT that we do for a PET CT scan is about 20 milligrams. So you get you get more dose from the CT when you do a PET CT. You get. No, if you just need a standard CT. Yeah. So a standard CT that includes the chest and abdomen pelvis would be about 20 milligrams. Uh, the two, 10, 20 milligrams. Yeah. And then just abdominal by itself would be 10. About about 10 to 15. Yeah. Yeah. A little more than the chest. Chest is there. But those are all very low values, but almost insignificant uh, on the clinical model. I've heard it, it said something about CT is 100 times the radiation from a chest x ray. So that's not true? Uh, it's true. Yeah, it's it's actually, the X ray is nothing. Yeah, chest x ray is nothing. Chest x ray is like 0, 0. 0. 0. 0.1 milligrams. It's very low. No, but you say compared to a chest x ray, yeah. it's like so ten, Yeah, it's on the other right, yeah. But it's still very low. It's like 100 times of a very, very low thing. You had one done every three months, I mean... I wouldn't be concerned about that. No, not a problem, because no, no. all these, these, these risks... These, yeah, I'll just speak up. The risks that, that are associated with radiation are based on a model that, that assumes that there is no level of safe radiation. It's called a linear no-threshold model. But as I showed you in one of the slides, by living on this planet, we have evolved to deal with low-level radiation because it's just there in the background. Do you consider From a CT low-level low, low, low yes. radiation? Yes. yes. <laughs> what if you're 20 years old and you had one every three months and three years? It can be different. It's you really yeah. need to be yeah. Yeah. But 20 years old, have it every three months for your whole life, yeah. then maybe it has a little bit of impact. But you have, but to, you have to weigh, you know, the... the right very, very small risk from the scans that you're getting with the benefit that you're getting from the scan. So, um, and it, so if you put that into, into your calculation, then the, the risk, the potential increased risk that you're getting from a scan is, becomes negligible. Even if you have 1.5% of risk, <coughs> even if you can prove that, even if it's true, 1.0.5 is nothing to when you compare to, I don't know, when you go in the street, right? additional risk for radiation is very low in comparison to all the risk of... Now, how many did you say you get every day from just living on the Earth? Uh, 0 0.72 0 0.72 yeah. and the remnants of a CT is... Yeah. So
So the, the what if you to say in REM, it's 2.5 REM is a PET CT. So 22 from the, it depends if you say milliRAM or REM. If you say REM, it's two REMs from the CT, the chest, the abdomen, and pelvis. Okay. About um, 0 0.5. So uh, how, how much more is it than normally dissipated on Earth for a day? It's so for, for a year, it's about uh, three to four times as much as a year living on the planet. Next. Next. You mentioned a couple of times, uh, one specifically, that uh, you have to go through chemotherapy and fail the chemotherapy or the PSA has to increase before you're eligible for something like this. Is that correct? So, um, currently in the US, that is correct. In this big industry sponsored trial, they go by step. So, they kind of start with a later stage and they will try to move forward in the indications and move earlier stage like they did with aviraterone or uh, enzalutamide. Initially it was later and then they, they, they tried to move earlier. Currently, yes, this big trial is for patients who have failed one or two chemotherapy regimens. In Germany, they are doing it at earlier stage because over there it's based on the compassionate use, it's not under clinical prospective protocols. And it looks it works better, of course, because the earlier you treat, the better uh, the success rate is. So I have nice stories from patients who uh, were not qualifying for these trials that we sent to our colleagues in Germany, and they did have a pretty good response, and it was before chemotherapy. Because I have, I have MCR, MCRPC, and I have not had a PSA that's measurable for 56 months now. That's good. Uh, but I have metastatic disease throughout my body. So my, my question is, what do I do? So in some patients, sometimes the PSA is not the best tool to assess uh, the, the, the disease burden. In most of the patients, PSA is a very reliable tool on which we can account, and it's very uh, good to monitor the therapy. In some patients, I don't know, I, I cannot tell you the, your, your, whole, uh, your, your whole case, but in some patients, the, the prostate cancer are not producing a lot of PSA. So PSA, even if it's zero, sometimes the burden of disease is higher. But maybe it's not your case. Maybe the treatment you had before had, did a good job and you just don't have a lot of prostate cancer in you, which would be good. Lupron, Zytiga, and ABT888 are PARP inhibitors. And, and the disease, you say, is, uh, is seen on scans or? or yeah, you yeah. get a scan every six months. Yeah. What kind of scan? Uh, City of Hope. body scan, full bone scan, plus the CT scan for the prostate cancer. So if you had a high PSA, okay, and you had a PSMA scan, okay, would that, would, would cancer show up if you had cancer? Yes. Okay. And that's opposed to other types of scan where you don't have a My tracer that is that is sensitive to the PSMA. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Uh, I think we have to talk for each uh, situation, specific clinical situation. I think what you're talking about is the recurrence after a first initial therapy, such as surgery or radiation therapy. Unfortunately, sometimes the first treatment, the primary treatment, doesn't work. <coughs> then patients are monitored with the PSA every three to six months, and sometimes you have what we call biochemical recurrence. You have recurrence, but it's only biochemical because we don't we see it only in the blood, but we don't know where it is. Here, yes, the most sensitive, even at lower PSA level, is PSMA in comparison to axiomy, for example. So what really you have is you have a high correlation between PSA, okay, and the PS, and, and in the PSMA test, the uh, test results. You have a high or if the PSA is yeah. going up, you're going to, your PSMA is going to show up True. at, is that right? Yes. Generally. Let, let's say some numbers. If you have a PSA below 0.5, yeah. after, uh, at the situation in recurrence mm -hmm. after surgery, you will have around 50 to 60% to see some disease on a PSMA PET scan. Okay. 
if you have a PSA below 0.2, so very low, very early recurrence, the percentage of chance to see some disease is about 30%. Okay. If you have a PSA above 1, then you reach almost 80 to 90% of sensitivity. Okay. And that's for the early recurrence yeah. stage. Which and is that's really not similar to other tracers. Other that's tracers, similar. okay. Probably wouldn't if you had a uh, if you had a low you know a PSA of around one you may or may not see the cancer okay with another type tracer is that what you're pointing to yeah so uh, comparing the tracers that are available yeah comparing the tracers that are available for prostate cancer imaging the best one is PSMA yeah because it's able to detect disease at a low PSA level where other tracers don't work as well. So, so do you have, do you have a uh, FDA, F, is that based upon F, FDA results, or is that based upon your investigational study? That's, that, that we actually did one study where we compared Exumin and, and PSMA. Say that again, I didn't hear. We, at UCLA we did one study where we compared PSMA and Exumin, uh, but there's been a number of, of studies that compared other tracers, you know, Tila and acetate, to PSMA. To PSMA, yeah. yeah. So we're working now on trying to get PSMA approved. Uh, the FDA meter needs to get the drug approved. To yeah. get, uh, NDA is very long, and we hope to get it, but we're working on it. So one day PSMA will be approved, but it's not now. Yeah, I have a question. You know, when you mentioned uh, Germany and uh, Australia. Australia. And they have found it effective and all. Do they have clinical trials and procedures along the line that verifies that this is good in their country? And then I'm thinking in relation to here in the U.S. I don't know much on it, but who's on who's who's on the evaluation team? Or it's going to take more time, and they seem to have made progress in this in this area. Um, that makes sense. You you want to say that maybe they are doing differently than here? And if so, how? how? What are the big factors? They, they are not, in fact. No, it's the same molecule, the same way to inject it. It's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. uh, you have, uh, of course, a lot of uh, chemical, pharmacological process and tests to go through to be approved, to be able to do it in the US. This will provide all the same formula that has been used in Germany and Australia to FDA, the inspectors, and then we do it. So it's the same way of treating patients. I mean, at least on the chemical or the, the, the drug that you inject. Then the time when you treat, then it can be completely different. In Germany, sometimes they treat before chemotherapy. They even treat some doctors I know in Bavaria. They even treat before hormonal treatment. In Australia, they selected more the patient with an additional scan, FDG which in the US has not been done. So then it's all about how you design the trial <coughs> and who do you treat, but it's not about how do you treat. It's more about who are the patients have been treated. Question? Six years ago, and the, the PSA is now to point 0.1, so the scan, can I request that at UCLA, the PSMA? Yeah. Yes, it's possible. We have one protocol that covers almost all the indication. However, at point one, the chance to see some disease are very low. Yeah, even yeah, 25, 30%. So then it's all about, I understand as a patient, you know that the disease is somewhere, you want to be sure that we cannot see it. Unfortunately, we don't have perfect technique at this low PSA level. In fact, there is no real good technique that can detect a disease. So, in view of the fact that it costs, yeah, we, you can try. But in view of the fact that it costs three thousand, depending on how you have to measure the, the, in view of what I said, twenty percent of seeing disease, thirty percent of seeing disease, PSA is point one, very low. Most likely, it's still in the prostate bed. That's why we do severe radiation therapy there. Then. If it was free, available for everyone, we could say, okay, let's just try and, and do it. But it's 
not the best indication for this time because the PSA is very low. False positive on PSA are very low. So FDG is another imaging scan with PET technique that detects what the glucose metabolism increase, very commonly used for cancer imaging. And here you need to be a bit be a more uh, careful about what you see because glucose is also increased. Uh, glucose metabolism is also increased in many other uh, processes than cancer, such as inflammatory or infectious. Okay. PSMA, of course, there is no perfect test. You have something positive, it has been reported, but it's very rare. So when you see something, usually you're pretty confident. Specifically when people are trained, it's very specific. So you have um, measurements to, to assess that. It is called specificity or positive predictive value. It means how many percentage of case it was actually disease, you reach 95% of the case with PSMA PET. It means when you see disease, the doctor said that it's probably cancer. In 95% of the case, it is actually cancer. So for this, it's not a concern. The concern in your specific case with a PSA of 0.1 is the sensitivity that is low. We may see just share my experience with all the patients we have. I know their story, I know what they had, but we are not acting on, on the, the decision to give chemo or not. So usually patients... But you must hear other doctors talk about it. I mean, is it is something that they're not using as much anymore? Or? Oh, no, it is used. Docetaxel is really commonly used. It's still common? Yes, it's, it's, it's Taxoter and even uh, uh, Cabazitaxel. Uh, okay. Jeftana are both very used. I had one more question. Uh, about six months ago, I had a PSMA test, and at that time, my uh, uh, PSA was uh, uh, 0.3, and I have uh, a PSMA scheduled in two or three months from now, and uh, my PSMA is 0.4. What's the probability, if I have cancer, okay, that the PSMA will indicate cancer somewhere in the body. Do you take hormone treatments? Say that again. Sorry, uh, do you, are you under hormonal treatments? Do you uh, uh, mild uh, hormone treatment, uh, okay. uh, uh, Casodex. Okay, so PSA 0.4, Casodex, I would say it's a bit half half. 50%? Yeah. Okay, so it's still a bit low. Wait. <laughs> Should I, should I uh, not take Casodex before the test? No, no, no. It would, uh, we cannot really assess the true impact on it, so I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't play with the treatment just for the imaging because we are not sure exactly in which trend it will go. So I would just stay safe, continue the treatment. Because when we hold off the treatment, we can be afraid that the disease uh, progressed. And so no. So you're saying not the whole. You continue offer. as you're doing. Any other questions? We want to thank you for uh, excellent presentation, both of you. And be sure that we're going to ask you back again sometime in the future. So let's give a <laughs>